Hello, and welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Thomas Sponsalt, CEO of Unison. Unison is a company that enables equity financing of residential real estate and gives you an alternative to debt financing. And with that, here's my interview with Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Jason. Thanks for taking the time today. Yeah, nice, nice to be here. Thank you for, for inviting us. I appreciate it. Pleasure. So Thomas Sponholtz, CEO of Unison. Tell us about Unison. Unison was, um, was established to serve two basic uh, but very important and very large needs in, in the world of finance. One is uh, to really introduce what we call equity financing and equity liquidity for residential homeowners. And on the other side, enable institutional investors such as pension funds, endowments, and so forth to get very efficient access to the world's largest asset class being uh, residential real estate. And um, if I take that one step deeper on the consumer side, what you really have in the economy is you have about $30 trillion worth of residential real estate in the United States alone. About 18 of the 20 trillion is equity in homes owned by 132 million homeowners. But homeowners have no access to liquidity for this equity they have in their home. So we, what we enable them to do is the same as a company who can essentially IPO a piece of their equity in order to get cash today. We enable the homeowner an ability to sell a piece of the equity they've earned in their home and not in form of debt. So there's no payments and no interest rate. It, we participate alongside with the homeowner in the change in value of the home of our down. So it's really over time, you as a homeowner might have lived in your house for 10, 20, 30 years, earned all this equity. And now finally you have access to this equity in pure form. And you can, so you can liquidate a piece of it, sell it to us, get cash back, never make a payment to us. And we get paid at the time you decide to sell the house. Again, 10, 20, 30 years in the future, or you can buy it out after three years in time it suits you. So it's really bringing equity into a, create an equity financing and equity liquidity for the benefit of consumers. It's really what's a big missing piece in residential real estate finance, as well as I would maybe even say more importantly for financial advisors, who now for the first time can include the client's biggest asset and I would say also the most important asset as part of the financial plan by including the equity that they own in the home, much like you include equity they own in a company or in the, as you know, in the past, it was stocks, bonds, cash, and very simplistically, now you're actually including the home. And for the average American, the equity in the home is about 80% of that net, net worth, but there was no way to include it before. And we enable to include that asset class and that asset in the financial planning for the consumer so they can make better decisions that are both debt and equity, much like companies or in other parts of financial markets. You know, people can finance their life uh, with debt and equity, and now you can do it in residential real estate as well. Excellent. So, I mean, I've had a couple of conversations about fractionalization of ownership, so we're going to definitely dive into it uh, a little bit further. But before we do, tell me about what the impetus was for the creation of the company. It came, uh, the very first idea came when I, I was working for, at the time, the world's largest institution investment management firm, uh, Barclays Global Investors. And we had just launched iShares, uh, obviously a way to make index investing very efficient for consumers. And uh, one of the problems we're having when we dealt with the institutions, again, big pensions around the world, was that many of these institutions have a natural need to deliver protection, inflation-protected investments to their participants in the plan. But And the biggest part of inflation is housing at about 40-some percent. And you can imagine if you're somebody saving up for retirement, when you retire, your biggest expense is most likely to be housing. But you could not invest in housing as an asset class, as an institution. But they had the mandate that they were given by the participants to protect them against this kind of housing inflation. So the first idea was, how do we create an efficient way for an institution investor to get exposure to the asset class of housing? That's where it started. And then very quickly thereafter came the the kind of the realization that the inverse problem lives with the consumer. The consumer has too much exposure to their individual house mm -hmm. rather than housing inflation in general. So when consumers had too much house for their financial plan and the institutional investor had too little. And so it's that imperfect imbalance between the two that created Unison. And what Unison does, and the, the, the reason we have the name Unison, is that both parties have a natural need. And Unison's job is to bring them together and create the financial product that is designed to to meet the demand and need that both of them have. That was really that was where it all started out. And for the consumer, it means perfect liquidity for the equity in their home, cash today, and never make any payments before they decide to sell the house. Up an institutional investor means equity, built a basically a big fund where they can 
with thousands of, of ownerships and homes that replicate mm-hmm. the U.S. housing market. And that became the thing that Unison does. We kind of connect these thousands of consumers with the institutional investors via our investment products and financial okay. products. That was the so, genesis of the idea. Excellent. So let's kind of explore how this works through the value chain, right? So I, I'm someone who... Want, I own a home, it's paid off for argument's sake. I want to raise equity for one of a number of causes, whether that be you know, pay for retirement, pay for uh, kids' education, whatever it is. My largest asset is my, is my home. Before, that sort of monetization would have required me to go to a bank and basically get a reverse mortgage or a mortgage or a line of credit or whatever it is. So really a debt facility that carried an interest rate. What we're talking about here is instead equity financing. So no, no actual interest payments, no interest payments, period. But I find your website. I discover, I discover I want to unlock some of my equity. Tell me what that looks like in terms of, in terms of numbers and experience. Yes. So most consumers come to us either via financial advisors or direct to us. So the experience for the consumer is either to be advised by their financial advisor or, or financial planner, or by coming straight to us and then interact with, with the advisors that we have in staff that are not financial advisors, but they're transaction specialists with and, and can help the consumer through the, uh, through the process. That's the first step. Then you provide the address, and then we provide you with, a, uh, with the sample economics of a transaction. And that could be, for example, you might have a, a million dollar house and we, let's say you, you have a need for $150,000, then we can provide you with $150,000 in cash today. And then we participate in a percentage of the future change in value of the house. In other words, all the equity you earned in the house up until today belongs to you. We participate mm-hmm. in future change in value. So if you paid off, in your example, you said that you paid off the house entirely. So that means you have a million dollars worth of equity. We will, but that, that belongs to you. And then we will participate, for example, in let's call it 40% or the future change in value from today's value. And then, so you have the million dollars you already earned, that belongs to you. We participate in 40% of the future change in value. And then we settle up when you decide again to sell the house or in, you might win the lottery and decide to buy us out early. For example, you can do that too. That is in no one's financial plan, okay? So let's just just step away from (laughs) I love the lottery line. Yeah, Um, no, no, exactly. I hope not. Okay, so what kind of percentage are we looking at here? What, what, to what degree are you participating in the change in value? So the example I gave you is a million dollar house. We provide $150,000 today in exchange for 40% of the future change in value of the house, right? Okay. So we provide $150,000 in cash today to the homeowner and mm-hmm. participate. And then we, we participate in 40% and the homeowner participate 60% of the future change in value of that house. That's okay. a typical example. So it's not a, it's not a true like ec- pure equity split there because you are taking on risk here. Let's be fair, and you're not you're not getting utility of the house. So if if the and we, and house- we don't and we, and we don't make it get any payments. Also, right? Yeah. There's no monthly payments of any kind. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So I mean, if I was to if I was to get a reverse mortgage and let it compound, that's a lot worse than forty percent. The longer the timeline gets, right? Like if I held that, sure. if I'm in my if I'm sixty five, and God forbid someone needs a reverse mortgage at sixty five, let's just say hypothetically that's the case. And I live sure. in my house until I'm 90, whatever it is, when I pass away, a reverse mortgage can eat away 100% of the equity in that home. So right. still far more attractive than the alternative, especially with longer timelines. So what about the downside? What happens if I sell the house at a loss? Then we participate in the loss alongside of you. So let's take this example. We gave you a million dollar house. We participate 60-40 in the homeowner's favor. The homeowner's 50% us 40% in the change in value. So if, if that house sells for let's call it 900,000, then there's a $100,000 loss. And we basically, we own 40% of that loss mm. and you own 60% of that loss. So it's equity, it's like a stock. You're buying stock in a company today. If it goes up, we both make money. If it goes down, we both lose money. Yeah, so you, you've truly it, built a, it, a true equity participation environment here where you bear risk just like they do. In fact, you know you bear, because you're taking a higher percentage, yeah, you, bo- you bear disproportionate gain, but you bear disproportionate loss at the same time. And that's all in exchange for all the benefits of the program, right? So it makes a lot of sense. So what is, so someone basically finds you or gets referred to you, they go through the website, get the quote, how long does the deal take to get closed? What's interesting about, as we all know, real estate is a very old industry. And what takes the longest is actually for the homeowner and the appraiser and the inspector to coordinate going going to the house and getting that done. That by far is what takes the longest. Theoretically, and agree, uh, this could be closed in a week. In practice, it, it takes, because of that coordination between the homeowner and the appraiser, it typically takes about two or three weeks. Can't automate that That's away right. yet, and, can you? No, I wish. And, and we use completely third-party appraiser. 
So it's not our appraisers, our inspectors. It's completely third party. So the homeowner coordinates it. It's not us. All right. So we want to keep that independence so that to make sure we all feel we're getting a fair price. Yeah. I mean, and, otherwise, uh, they would enter into the question of like, you know, you lowballed my my valuation because, you know, you want the upside. So, yeah, the independence is absolutely exactly. vital there. I see that. It's critical. Yeah, it's critical. And we have, if you look at the other side of our business where we're an investment management firm for institutions, our mandate by the institution is just to get a fair participation in the, ty- in the price of the home over the long run. Right. So it's very patient capital mm-hmm. over a very long period of time. Right. So uh, it's, again, it's like an index fund, right? You're just essentially buying the market at whatever the price is that day. That's what we do. So that's why we, we both built better served by using independent appraisers entirely. Just fair establish enough. the fair price. Yeah. And actually, many questions stem from this, um, from, from that comment. So first off, we're talking about institutional pricing. Institutional investors tend to be more patient than retail. Absolutely. Talk to me about like what their return expectations are. Like, I mean, that, that conversation must be had, or is this purely being looked at as well, like an inflation hedge by them? It's really an asset allocation and inflation mm-hmm. hedge. If we shift completely over to an institutional investor, it's, it's very different value proposition mm-hmm. because institutional investors have zero exposure today to the biggest asset class in the world. I mean, just mm-hmm. think about that. That's, Think about a pension fund saying, I'm not going to buy any stocks. And stocks is, is not, it's about half the size of the asset class of residential real estate. It's really, they have had no ability to get exposure to the asset class of residential real estate. That just wasn't a way to get sizable exposure. And what works here for the institution is that, yeah, the homeowner doesn't make any payments and he gets to enjoy the house and he doesn't make any rent. But the institutions get a benefit of the homeowner taking care of the house, making sure it works and, and it's being kept in good shape and so on. So there's a nice exchange of, services and benefits between the homeowner and the investor that way. And that it really ena- enables the investors to get exposure to thousands of homes without having to build a massive property management capability that's very expensive. Mm-hmm. So it's, the, that's this exchange to make a work for the institution. So, so to answer your question, what the institution gets is they get an asset class that's very large that haven't previously been able to get exposure to. It's an asset class that's very diversifying relative to the stock and bond market. And three, an asset class that's 40% of inflation, which is their ultimate bogey that they have to beat in the long run. It's a missing asset class in their asset allocation. And that's, yeah, again, I mean, is why I started it, right? It, it's just missing. Yeah. I mean, well, just, you know, we think about it to date, the alter- the only option for investment in residential real estate has largely been residential REITs, in which case you're dealing with a renter right. environment, not an ownership environment, which, I mean, can be lucrative but at the same time. I mean, there's been plenty of studies done that show that people who own uh, who own property tend to treat it better than people who don't, and therefore the the cost of maintenance tends to be higher on rental on average. So yeah, it's it's exactly. it's it's interesting. Uh, and not only that, I mean, there's, we can get the different issues surrounding multi tenant dwellings and everywhere else, everything else, but it's complicated. So right. yeah, it is. I mean, it's a it's a pretty gaping hole when you think about it. So yeah, so basically this gets turned over two weeks. How much attention is your company or or the investors in general paying towards like regional diversification? Like if you start to get too much interest from one region of the country or one city in particular, are you concerned about capping that off for too much, for, for lack of diversity? We are. And obviously we have to construct a portfolio that is in line with the mandate we have from, from the from investors. The way to deal with that very simply is to be able to originate in many different areas around the country. So for example, we are in 30 states around the country, have originated in over a thousand cities. So we have the ability to originate across many, many states. And that's why it's important the way we have the way consumers come to us, as, as I explained earlier, is either by our partnerships or our own direct-to-consumer outreach. And so if partners are bringing us, to use your example, a disproportional number of assets from Washington, D.C., and Boston, for example, then our direct-to-consumer effort would then focus their effort in the other locations where we then, where we're not getting deals from the partners and thereby balancing out the portfolio. That makes Having said sense. that, diversification, as we all know, as all your financial advisors know, diversification truly is the only free lunch in investment management, right? So it's there, there are still some advisors get... you got to convince of that, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, yes, the only you're proven right. one. There yeah. might be some we don't know. There might be some we yeah. don't know, but the only yeah, one exactly. we do know. It's, yes, it's, academia has proven it. Everybody, whether you want to believe it or not is your choice. <laughs> Fair enough. But so, a simple, a very simple decision as it relates to a home is that a single home has the same volatility or risk, as we call it, as the stock market. Like mm-hmm. a single home has the same volatility as the stock market. And you and the typical American have 70 to 80% exposure to that single stock, if you will. That's the same volatility, but that's not very good asset allocation. But if you take the national market, that volatility goes from 15% to 5%. 
just by diversifying across the country and having thousands of homes in a portfolio rather than just one home. It's interesting because, I mean, I start thinking of a paradigm of, you know, if you're investing in, in your own, you know, of course, you invest in your own real estate uh, just by nature of owning it. But when you think about it, I mean, if I could potentially trade off some of the risk of my region to buy a more diversified pool by, you know, say, for example, selling it, you know, raising equity through you and then diversifying in a equivalent pool of real estate around the country. I think that would, you know, at least from my risk management standpoint, my mindset, I, I absolutely do like that idea. Now, I know I've heard of kind of like risk sharing, risk sharing models being floated in the past. And typically the average consumer is not big on that sort of thing in general because right. you know, control, they, they like to, they don't necessarily trust their neighbors to maintain the properties properly, but they'll trust themselves. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. again, diversification is a wonderful thing. You, you know, you haven't, you're always going to have good and bad actors in every pool. So a large enough pool should be fine. But it's funny because you I mean, you're, you're doing this at the institutional level, but I gotta, I gotta think that perhaps there's a potential market on the retail level as well. I'm sure there is. I, I will say that's not our focus. And for the simple reason that the vast majority of Americans just already have way too much exposure to residential housing as it is. Mm -hmm. So the biggest, the biggest change we can make there is, is to enable the homeowner or to diversify. So let, let's just take an example. Imagine you have a 60 year old homeowner thinking about how to retire and, and they would like to have more income in retirement. The best in many cases, as a way of example, could be to maybe lick, and they want to stay in the home and they got all this equity, maybe liquidate some of the equity and buy an income producing investment it can, mm -hmm. in form of a, in, it could be a mutual fund or an annuity that pays out once you retire. But that really enables you to both get the quality of life from living in the home you want and have lower diversification and more income. Yeah, it really is. It really is staggering to think that up until now, I mean, the fractionalization of ownership was just a non-starter. Home ownership was a non-starter. And, and you're right, like the amount that we have completely tied up in one giant asset. And, and for everybody, for so many people, it, you know, it's the last act. It's always the security. It's the last asset they're going to touch because uh, the unfortunate burden was that anything else to go into, to be, anything else was debt based and it was just going to erode yeah. their equity even further. So it didn't make a lot of sense. No. I mean, borrowing, it's, it's borrowing your own money, right? It's, Basically. You own a house and you have equity and now you now you go to the bank and they want you to pay an interest on the money that you own, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's a great deal for the bank, but it's, you're borrowing your own money and paying an interest rate on that and you might end up in nothing. And it really is, the homeowner has, has an equity problem, right? And an equity opportunity. They have equity in the home, they just don't have liquidity. So yeah. what we, that's what we're saying, let's have an equity Equity problem needs an equity solution where the homeowner is Absolutely. in charge. It's really as simple as that. It's like a company. Do I want to, I need cash? Do I want to issue debt or do I want to issue equity? Depending on my financial situation and my financial goals and, and what have you. It's a very simple idea um, that we didn't invent. We just introduced it and built what was required to, to do that scale. Yeah. And more often than not, a conversation goes towards retirement, but you can think of any number of, I mean, there's any number of times where your the large liquid asset in your life could solve your solution if only you could liquidate without giving up the right to yeah. it. Right. And I think that, you know, there's, whether that be, you know, I think about just whether that be even wanting to start your own business or basically running in or that business running into a period of hardship or need to expand your own business. You know, to date, almost everything has been debt-based solutions, which by the, you know, like, as you said, by their nature, you're basically paying someone to access your own capital as opposed to being able to access your own capital. So it's like, what an ingenious solution for a problem that shouldn't exist. <laughs> you know, we, yeah, yeah. So you actually don't have a problem. It's more that you don't have a solution. You don't. That's the problem. That's, that's exactly right. Exactly. You know, and I think it's, and any business owner, any entrepreneur can attest to the frustration of that. It's like, well, on paper, I'm worth this money, you know, this much money, but in terms of my investment accounts, you know, there's a fraction of it there. And if I need liquidity, well, you know, the largest thing, the thing that makes me super wealthy is, is the, is the thing that basically makes me super liquid too. So it can be a challenge. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, I try to tell your family that now we're going to sell the house and buy a small one because you want liquidity. I mean, that's not a popular discussion because no, I would a house is not, it's not just a financial asset. It's, it's an emotional asset. It's a, has a practical need of, you know, we need shelter. So it's a, it's a very interesting asset. And, and what we're really trying to do is slightly more academic, but it's really trying to separate the living of a home and the, the experience of having a home from the financial liability and the financial asset of a home. So you can separate mm -hmm. them and manage both of them optimally. But you can live and have the experience you want in your home. Like, for example, now during COVID, a lot of people have decided to move out of the city because they need more space. They need you know, two more rooms because they're working from home. Well, why not do that, right? But that doesn't mean you have to own the entire house. You can just own the part that is financially responsible and comfortable for your own. Yep. So you exactly. can get, get so you're separating the living of 
in a house from the financial commitment of a house and making both rational. And it was just missing. Like what we're doing was just missing. And now it's here. Yep. It's uh, <laughs> a frustrating conversation I've had on many occasions in regards to the lack of ability to do anything other than that. So I appreciate that. So talk to me about feedback in general. I mean, clearly you have institutional demand for this because other people didn't, you wouldn't be doing it because that's the course of equity capital. How about the actual people who've, who've utilized your system? What's the feedback you've gotten from them? You know, it's interesting when we, when we launched the business on the consumer side in the beginning, it was really a classic new to the world product experience meaning that we didn't know how to describe it, how to talk about it. We didn't know what we might feel it serves certain needs, but what does the consumer do? Do they feel they have a need or do they have a need but don't want to act on it? And how do you communicate? Do you communicate to an intermediary or direct? And in all this, you can just imagine this mirror of, of experiences that we had. So we decided to just basically go out on a, on a large scale and try all types of channels and all kinds of messaging to get the feedback from the market rather than us having hypotheses mm-hmm. about what worked. And, and we learned a lot. I mean, just how to talk about it. We learned, for example, that using the word equity financing was difficult to understand because people thought it was home equity line of credit mm-hmm. in the beginning. And then you had to un- unexplain it, especially for, for mortgage brokers, for example, they were talking about it. They had to unexplain rather than explain. So that was on. And, but when we come down to, you know, to answer your question directly about what was the reception, what we learned is um, communicating directly to the consumer is a lot easier many times than going through intermediaries because they know they have a need. It can be to, they want to pay off medical debt, credit card debt, student debt, pay for the kids' tuition, buy a summer house, plan for retirement, right? And then once they learn that there's a way to do it, an alternative, they just look at the alternative. It can be you can sell stock in the portfolio, they can sell equity in the house, they can borrow money. And then the consumer is really very good about saying, you know what, I want to explore this more and that fits me. So what we really learned is that we, we need to clearly explain what it is and how it works and just let the consumer decide what alternatives is best for them. So it's very different than an established product where they, they go out and specifically grab something off the shelf because historically that has been the only solution to their need, right? So it's really was, we had to insert ourselves into that discussion. So what have we learned? We learned that the biggest use cases uh, really is retirement planning and in retirement. So both of those, right? And then paying off debt. So in other words, you have debt, but you also have a lot of equity. So now you sell a piece of your equity to pay off your debt, and then your economy is in better balance. So we have, there's a lot of that going on. And that way, people are experiencing you know, higher FICOs, better balance, and they can sleep at night. So we're seeing a lot of debt, debt by equity rebalancing using, using the equity in the home. And then, as I said, the financial planning and uh, for retirement is, is very big. So those are, I, would, I would say those are the two big ones. So then the third one is a little bit part of retirement, but it's really home improvement, especially right now with COVID, right, where people want to build an extra office, for example. Well, um, I mean, that or you're, that. you're just stuck indoors and you're seeing the condition of everything and you're deciding, I need something to do with my time because I can't go out and spend money elsewhere. <laughs> so <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't want to take on more debt, essentially, right? Exactly. We're seeing a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So I have three questions I ask people before we wrap up every time and to kind of make you think in a positive okay. note. The first question is, is, if you had something you could change in your company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? This is a really good question. <laughs> Would you mind if I separate the two between no, the industry and the company? You're, you're allowed more than all. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, of course, the first wish is always to have more wishes, right? So by all means, go right ahead. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. What I wish we could change about the industry, and I define the industry in this case to be consumer finance. What I really wish is that there's real education of the consumer of consumer finance. For example, when you get a credit card or a mortgage or a debt, that's not a video tutorial or a brochure that tells you how this actually works, right? You, you get a big stack of legal documents you can't understand. So what I wish is that there was just more education about financial consumer finance products to the consumer. And I mean that all the way from when you go to school, or high school, I feel it should be obligatory to take personal finance, just the basics. And I feel that when you go shopping for a financial product or insurance product, it would be helpful if there's an actual education involved. And maybe even a little test, just for getting the basics down so that we can all make more rational decisions. Because as a consumer, it's always us against the behemoth company, right? And, and they have more information than we do as an individual consumer. And we don't make this transaction every day. We do it maybe once every three years. And it, my counterpart does it every day as a business. So a little bit of education of the consumer, I think, could go a long way in making the consumers make better decisions and help the companies get better clients, more educated clients, and manage the expectations on both sides. I think benefits the system as a whole. So that's a wish for the industry. As it relates 
to the company, I think it can change. We need to constantly better balance the, the, the pressure of growth versus quality growth. That's the balance always. There's a lot of pressure from investors and so on to grow like mad because it's a very big opportunity and a big need. At the same time, quality growth is what enables you to go long, not just to get short-term success, but long-term success, right? So it's the balance between hyper growth now versus long-term growth, high-term quality growth. That Having everybody on the same page for that can be difficult because as humans, we just like growth. And we get distracted when there's a lot of opportunity and we want to pursue everything. So it's, it's really quality growth over hyper growth. And get everybody on that page can be helpful in a company like ours because the opportunities that there's $18 trillion of equity out there that's locked up in homes that can be more efficiently deployed into the economy. But we don't have to do all of them, right? So that's an operator's perspective. It might not be a very interesting thing to say, but from an operator perspective, that is that's certainly something that could be very helpful, I think, for most growth company CEOs. Excellent. So second question for you, what's been the biggest challenge in the company to where it is today? You may have already answered this in terms of education, but I'm going to ask it again. Yeah, it's balancing growth. How quickly do you want to grow? And how quickly can you grow? grow? Like what is the optimal growth path and speed? That is the biggest challenge. And, that's a con- that's a, and the reason it's a challenge is because that reflects on how much capital do you raise at what price to how many people do you hire? How many expenses do you have? How much do you invest in growth before the revenues come in? Right. So if you're going like if you're going very fast, you have to invest a year ahead of your growth, and that's very expensive. So when things slow down, then you have high expenses and lower revenues. So it's it's, it's that constant balance again. And so the biggest challenge is just the speed of growth. And when you're building a company in an industry and in a business where you are the you are building the cat, we're building the category that never existed before. We have nobody to look to. We're the ones that have to we have to create the path. And that means we make a lot of mistakes. There are things that make a lot of. <laughs> Well, that means that we, we also go down a lot of dark alleys that seem mm-hmm. to make sense in forward mode, but in hindsight makes no sense, right? And that's when you grow, you, you, know, you hope that your batting ratio is over 50%. And when you grow a lot, that means you have a lot of expenses that never panned out to revenues, and then you have others that are highly successful. So then on to the final question is basically, what excites you the most about what it is you're working on and keeps you getting out of bed every morning to keep on fighting the good fight? This is going to sound slightly hokey, but it's the truth. So I got to <laughs> stick to that. The idea of adding something using, and this is personal, and I, but I also believe it's for a lot of people that work in the company. The idea of waking up every morning and using your skill and your energy to enable millions of people live a better life by adding something that's missing to the world. That's really mm-hmm. just obviously missing. And using your energy and intellect and teamwork to add that to the world so that more people can win. And, and the whole system wins, not just one person win and one person lose. Like everybody wins from have, from Everybody wins from introducing what we do. And the burden on us is to educate everybody why this is better for them, because it is. And that's what breaks you up every day. It, adding that value to the world is very rewarding, professionally and personally. It's not hokey. It is valid. And I will say this much. I mean, frankly, this is not just a financial option or a financial instrument or whatever you want to call it. This is, this is something that enables people to live their lives better. So I totally get where you're coming from on it. Thank so you. So with that, and Thomas, that, very much appreciate That's why people answer. join us. Go ahead. Uh, that's I, what I'm saying. That's <laughs> that, that is. It is. And, and that's, yep. we like that. You get the old save so, the world, the, or, sorry, change the world sales pitch when you're hiring. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it's also, I would hope, why you reached out to us, right? We're adding something that's important and people need. Absolutely. So thank you for the well, opportunity. Fractionalized real estate is something I've taken an interest in because uh, it's not enough of it, enough options for it out there. So for various reasons. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Very much appreciated. And uh, basically, I uh, hope everyone takes the time to look into this as an alternative to the current situation of debt financing. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for the opportunity. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Thomas Bonsall to Unison. I know I did. And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca.